Yeah, this one I'm going to give you the lobe. This is from upper lobe. Okay. Yeah, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> now that now that we have lots of discussion on the lobe uh, specificity or centricity, so now I want to give you some more information. This is from upper lobe, and we have a surgical lung biopsy. Uh, so this is a bigger biopsy than transbronchial cryobiopsies. Obviously, you can yes. see um, you have the central areas, peripheral areas, the pleura, and everything. And the tips of the the biopsies are also present. Uh, yes. If that is relevant. So Raghav, can I uh, ask you one second? I'm not going to ask you about any clinical thing. Okay, let's do pure pathology. Is this the only uh, lobe? Or are there other lobe biopsies coming? We, we do upper lobe, middle lobe, and lobe, all three lobes. We do so you have, have the all... other two to yes, show? Okay, yes. just one second. And then the other thing I want to mention is, let's just ask, take a little poll between the three of us, right? Raghav, can you take it to the lowest possible mag? Just the scanning, like go out even more. So between the three of us, guys, let's say UIP or not UIP based on this picture. Not UIP. Matt? Not UIP. Not UIP. Look, complete consensus between three, three <laughs> of us. <laughs> Absolutely not UIP, right? This is almost diffuse. Actually, this brings up a very interesting point about NSIP that people ask. They say, you, you know, it, and it comes up once in a while is how much spared lung can you have? You know, mm. how diffuse does it need to be? Can you have a little bit of spared lung? And usually, at least I think that you really shouldn't have much spared lung but a little bit of variation in thickening is acceptable. You know, so like here in the subplural areas, it gets slightly less. And then um, on the other side, again, slightly less, but slightly more in the middle. I think that's acceptable as long as it's fairly diffuse. There's no scarring, no honeycomb change. So Raghav, it, do you agree with that interpretation? No scarring, I, no honeycomb? I do. I do agree with that interpretation that it does have a NSIP kind of look here. At low um, mag, yeah. Yes, at low mag. Yeah. And there is no architectural distortion, means scarring or honeycomb changes. Yes. So, I mean, what I'm trying to get at, I'm not saying this is NSIP. I'm just saying at, at so far, it is not UIP. And all three of us would agree. Hopefully, you also agree, Raghav, not UIP in, in this field. Right? I, I did agree when I first looked at this slide. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what comes with the others. So, yeah. let me show you the same low mag of the middle lobe and lower lobe also. That's what I asked. Sorry, and one question. For you, this uh, right side is not uh, the structuration. It's not, I mean, like in the small piece, there is the, the right side is a, has somehow lost its structure a little bit. Yes, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Irene, I, I, so you're asking, is that scarring or not, or architectural distortion? This is. I, this I is would different. be doubtful. I'm, yeah, I'm it's doubtful. doubtful. I, I don't think it's completely lost yet, the architecture. So I think this is still within the realm of, um, you know, fairly maintained lung architecture. So at least when I'm, what's going through my head right now is, is this some sort of a CTD ILD with all these lymphoid follicles and germinal centers? Or is the whole thing SRIF? Or third, is this a UIP in which he's only showing us the one part of the thing and the other lobes have clear cut UIP? You know, that's what's going through my head at, at this mic without knowing think, anything else. I think those are perfect uh, differential diagnosis, Sanjay. This is a middle lobe. Oh. Yeah. Now we are in the middle lobe. So, any thoughts? So, you are missing some honeycomb changes, right? What about now? Now I think you have a little, now I, I can't see much at this low mag, but right in the middle of the upper piece, there's an area that has at least microscopic honeycombing. Yeah, there. And um, again, Irene is like Irene mentioned, there's a little bit of, you know, scarring like there it was in the previous one. And there's a fibroblast focus in the, in the uh, bottom of the largest uh, honeycomb cyst. Yeah, yeah, there's a fibroblast focus there. So things are beginning to get uh, hot and interesting. <laughs> Yes. For me, <laughs> for me, this is this is this is structurated. I would maybe I would call this one UIP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's getting there, and, yeah. you, and you've got some normal lung on the right side, right? So yes. there's on the other no, in the other piece there there was also normal Correct. lung. I saw. Yeah, this is the middle lobe and the normal lung. Yes, yes. There is some normal lung here right here a lot mm -hmm. of normal lung right yes I mean, rather on the right side it's almost completely um, fibrotic 
and on this side there's almost a and is there are there uh, smokers macrophages in there Raghav, in that lung that you were just showing us just show us the um, alveolated normal lung on the left yeah side. there there are there yeah. are macrophages okay just just checking to see what else is in there there are macrophages and yeah the famous pigmented macrophages are present okay now we are in the lower lobe. I have two two slides of this lower lobe. Uh, so this is one. This is a very good case because it really shows you the challenge of these cases and how uh, you could- More of honeycomb changes, yeah. more of lymphoid aggregates. I want to hear the uh, what Matt and Irene think first before I, I <laughs> say something because let, let me show you one more and then yes, we yes. can take their uh... yes and I'll tell you one more thing that happens in these you know when you have multiple people looking at the same thing sometimes what the first person says influences the other people right oh so yes you do oh, not yes. want to say hey not at all I, <laughs> you're just talking crap you know because something happens is the first person what they say might be completely opposite to what the what do you think? But you think, oh my God, if he's saying this is a classic NSIP and I think it's UIP, it'll look, you know, there's conflict. <laughs> it looks it looks like there's a problem, right? I, 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 have, I have an idea. Why don't we all write down on a piece of paper what we think our diagnosis I is? I love and that. Then, and then we can show it up to the camera. Let's do that. And then that I have way. I to look for one. <laughs> I, should, I, should I be writing because I know the diagnosis? You should well, be writing too, right? You should write yours too, right? That way you can't change. I can't change. Okay. Can you show us what you were going to show us in the last piece? Uh, this this is the go? this is the fourth one. This is the last one. This is the last one. That's a great idea, man. Let have us commit. <laughs> Can you, uh, Raghav, can you show us the middle lobe thing one more time before I um, put my thing down on this? So that's the middle lobe. Uh, so we have two pieces here. One of the pieces has got this honeycomb changes here, the peripheral uh, fibrosis, the subpleural fibrosis. You don't, you, <laughs> I think your description is biasing us. But how about the one below? How about, no, the other piece, Raghav? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I should not bias, right? Yeah, that's right. You just mentioned that. Okay, I, I think I'm, I'm, yeah. How about you two, ready? No. Yeah, you can, don't write the comment here. <laughs> <laughs> don't That's have my... to write the comment, okay. right? <laughs> okay, who's going first? <laughs> uh, since it's my <laughs> idea, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Okay. Let's see, let's see your thing, man. Hold it up to the. You'll have so to. I come said you, so I said UIP with UIP. possible with possible UIP CTILD. With possible CTILD. Yeah. Um, with sorry, with what? Uh, tissue disease related. IL. Okay. UIP CTILD. Nice. Irene. The same. We I should not a... have a consensus like this. What did you say? UIP smoking and what? What did you Co say? Below that. Come and look for CVD. I call, I call it yeah. CVD. Collagen vascular yeah. disease. Very, Very difficult, <laughs> but favor <laughs> you. So we, we have consensus in four pulmonary that pathologists. Is, man. That, that's not bad. Actually, I would, my guess is if you showed it to four other lung pathologists without telling them all this discussion, you would get a lot of different interpretations yeah. on this. Can I ask a question? What, what do people think about a combined NSIP and UIP diagnosis or like overlap? Or I, I sometimes see cases that are that are that are called that. And and and, and I won't bias you with, with what I think of that. But given this appearance in the one lobe, calling this NSIP and the other one's UIP. Let me hear it from the, these guys first. Uh, I think, I think that this is this is maybe SR, SRIF. This this upper lobe. I, I saw the, the fibrosis and, and the macrophages. Maybe maybe it's not NSIP in this one. I, yeah. I know it's 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 um, diffuse, but not but as we have seen the other parts, 
I like the collagen and the macrophages. Maybe it's uh, this combined. Uh, it's... Uh, but Irene, let's say this was classic NSIP, right? Let's, let's say, say it was that. Like this. Do, what would you do if it's UIP in one lobe and NSIP in another lobe? What do you? Do? I would. Um, if there is, if there is um, preserved lung, normal lung, I would call it UIP. Because as NSIP, I can, I, I think I can find. NSIP like areas in UIP cases, but if it's all, if it's all, if it changes a lot, I would maybe go just descriptive and say it's non-classifiable. And with the and with the follicles, it's it's good for collagen vascular. And maybe sometimes they have no no not a good pattern or not a classic pattern. Or mix. Raghav, what would you do? What do you do if there's UIP in one lobe and NSIP in another? Yeah, uh, so since this book says that focal NSIP is allowed in UIP, <laughs> uh, so I would still favor UIP. That's easy for me. But I like Irene was making a good point that the, some of the background stuff could be because of smoking related. Yes, I actually uh, agree with that. So Matt, I know you you will uh, challenge me on this, but I think the the okay. that part which which we were looking at, you know, another thing about SRIF, I think we haven't mentioned enough is that, uh, Raghav, if you can go back to that spot where, where Irene was saying that it looks like um, SRIF. Yeah, it's on the, yeah, that side. So just, yeah, just stop it there. You know, there's another thing about SRIF is that these spaces look boxy, you know? They look like rigid. Yeah. They look rigid spaces. Yeah. So what happens is the emphysematous lung, because the walls are now uniformly thickened, each emphysematous space looks like a, not a rectangle, but rigid, you know? There's mm -hmm. that rigid, and I think that's very good for SRIF. Now, one interesting thing when you guys have brought up the CTD ILD, I know because of the lymphoid follicles and the germinal center, but I'll tell you one interesting historical fact, okay? So historically, when, when Libo described the, the DIP thing, one of the features that they had described was lymphoid follicles mm -hmm. in DIP cases. And interestingly, you also get lymphoid follicles in SRIF once in a while. So you have here and there, you know, scattered lymphoid follicles. In fact, if you look at Carrington's paper from 1978, they actually mentioned that uh, some sparse interstitial infiltrate is necessary for a diagnosis of DIP. So I think what's, what they're bringing up is that in these smoking-related interstitial fibrosis cases, or what, what I would now, now call SRIF, it's not unusual to have occasional lymphoid follicles and germinal centers. Now I acknowledge this case has a lot. I mean, there's so many, you can see that low max. So it's yeah. certainly reasonable to think about a CTDILD, but I'm actually more in line with um, Irene's suggestion that uh, at least some of that fibrosis is SRIF, it's not NSIP. And then the second issue um, is of the UIP NSIP thing, Matt, that you asked about. So I do, it, I use UIP as the trump card. If, if, it, if there's UIP in any lobe, I call it UIP. And that's because of two studies. One was by Dr. Kazenstein, which she did with uh, University of Pennsylvania people, where she looked at explant you know, pneumonectomies, where she showed that cases of classic IPF transplanted for IPF and with UIP often have NSIP in other lobes and makes no difference. And another is an old study by Flaherty et al, where they looked at you know, UIP, NSIP discordance cases, and they all behave like UIP. So the prognosis is always like UIP. So it's it's a bit like, in, in my mind, the concept is if you have a adenocarcinoma in one lobe and a granuloma in another one, is that malignant or benign? <laughs> you know, yeah. that's how I look at it. I agree. Yeah. No, that's a good analogy. Uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, so even if there's some areas with NSIP, I still take the UIP thing because for me, as a lung pathologist in the non-neoplastic world, the most important job is to recognize UIP. That's what I feel about uh, this job. Uh, so okay, if you- Can I ask one more question to you guys? Because this is a very uh, interesting point to bring up. This is about lymphoid follicles and CTDILD, right? I'm, yeah. I want to ask you guys how you practice. Let's say a case is just beautiful CTDILD. It has uh, NSIP everywhere. There's no UIP. There's lots of lymphoid follicles, and you're saying, "Man, this has got to be CTDILD." What do you say in your top line diagnosis, Matt and Irene? NSIP. <laughs> we look comment in the comment. The presence of fol lymphoid follicles in pleura uh, 
bronchioles, whatever, uh, makes uh, rise the possibility of CTDILD. CVAD. And what happens then if you don't have a CTDILD uh, by serology and clinical features and all that? Nothing yeah. because uh, not I, I just of, said NSIP. It's, yes, so I'm asking for <laughs> So in a patient who you think has CTDILD, but does not have a CTDILD, what do you think is going on? Is that still a CTDILD or not a CTDILD? I think some things are not that easy to, maybe it's not a, a rheumatoid arthritis or so, but... Mm, has, a my, flavor, has a flavor of CTDILD, maybe? Maybe, or... Yeah. or That's the, what people the, call IPAF nowadays, right? People call that IPAF is a case that does not have a CTD. That means they went to a rheumatologist and the rheumatologist said, no, that's not a CTD. So they said, how dare he? I'm a pulmonologist and I feel that the patient has joint pain and you know the ANA is slightly increased. How dare they say that's not a CTD. We'll give it our own name. And the name they gave is IPAF. Interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, which I like to call flavor. Autoimmune <laughs> flavor, right? So some people, uh, I want to ask Matt first before I, I kind of <laughs> uh, editorialize on this. So Matt, what do you do? L let's say you have a classic CTDILD on biopsy. How do you top line it? I, I, I still don't put that in my top line. It, that that's that's yeah. me. It comes up. You in can a never comment. feel with a description, right? With <laughs> I think many lung pathologists have figured this out. Yeah, you just put it in the comments. Let and... me ask you then the same question. What if the patient then doesn't have a CTD on serology and all that? What 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 do you think is going on there? Is that a CTDLD or not? It's not, and I think these are non-specific features. I think you can see them in other things, right? Some yes. some patients who have some of the familial types of interstitial lung disease, including shortened telomeres, can have more right. lymphocytes and things like that. So it, it's not um, I, I don't think it's a it's a feature, but it, it's not diagnostic of that. I think it's a clue, but not a definitive diagnosis that it has to be a CTLD. Correct. And I think, you know, now to, I, I'll just, you know, this is really the crux of the problem. The crux of the problem is that people have different views about what happens if something has a so-called CTD histology, but no CTD. And they're like the CTD fanatics who say, no, this is still a CTD because we called it a CTD. Yeah. And this has classic CTD features. There are other people who say this is IPAF because it doesn't have a classic. And there are other people who say, well, if there is nothing clinically to support that diagnosis, it's idiopathic. You know, it's we don't know what's it's it's still an SIP, but it does it doesn't uh, have a classic CTD. So, Raghav, how do you see this whole problem? Yeah, may, means I think you guys hit the uh, hit the problem right away. So in this patient, the rheumatology consult was negative for CTD. Mm. So it was negative. It was they could not find anything uh, suggestion of uh, CTD. And then the other problem uh, Matt was mentioning was the patient had a family history where two of his relatives had some unspecified respiratory disease. Uh, and then there was a suggestion of genetic testing was uh, uh, told to the patient, but they could never get it because of some issues. Uh, so the point about this problem is you have what you think is features of CTD, but like you mentioned, um, like Matt was mentioning, I don't top line that uh, in my diagnosis mentioning CTD. I just mentioned that in the comment. In yeah. the top line, I would say that um, this describe this inflammation, lymphoid aggregates. And in the, in the comment section, I do say that if the CTD uh, serologies are negative and then it could well represent IPAF autoimmune features, I do mention that. I've been starting mentioning that because to answer this problem where the CTD workup is negative uh, and then clinically they don't think it's CTD. <laughs> right. Yeah, so there are three There are three flavors of this, right? One is classic CTD, patient has CTD, fine. Yeah, That's yeah. It. Classic CTD, patient, patient doesn't have a CTD, but they have flavor, you know? The joint hurts a little bit. There's a little bit of ANA. Some other serology is slightly positive, where a rheumatologist would say, well, this happens all the time in patients who don't have CTDs, but the pulmonologist insists. And the third situation is no sign of anything, right? There's not even the slightest sign that the patient has CTD, but the histology is still, you know, so-called CTD histology. So we have to, 
you know, I think there's no way to solve this because everybody has a different concept in their mind of, yeah. of what that might be. And uh, uh, just as briefly, Raghav, about your thing about the patient has two pa uh, relatives with non-specific respiratory disease. I have two relatives with non-specific respiratory disease. I bet Irene and uh, Irene and Matt have two relatives with non-specific respiratory disease yeah. too. You know, I what 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 does that mean to have? Yeah. You know, what does that mean if even if a patient has a relative who has uh, you know cystic fibrosis or something else? I think the only time that actually means something is if you have a strong family history of IPF or some sort of you know pulmonary fibrosis. Then you can say that there is a genetic thing going on or maybe you tested for telomerase or you know you found tert mutations in the family then it makes some sense but otherwise i feel the genetic thing is also uh, pushed too far sometimes you know we we accept too many things as possibly genetically related i think it also depends on the demographics of the patient right if this is a 40 something year old patient with what looks like uip i think that that's another clue that this is not your standard uip you know in a 65 year old male right that that would be another clue that there's yes. potentially a familial component. Is there any thoughts? Somebody has to tell this patient to stop smoking. Yes. Is it a smoker, Raghav? Did you find out? Yes, he is a smoker. And uh, uh, so to give you specifically, yeah, he had been smoking since years and years and years. So uh, obviously uh, he was in a construction job, but otherwise he was a heavy smoker. And now there was no connective tissue disease. Um, and then they asked him to stop smoking, and now the symptoms are much better. Uh, so, Raghav, can you just bring it back to those smokers' macrophages for one second? Yes. Yes. Matt, do you like that for DIP? Now it's it's full of <laughs> <laughs> the air spaces are full of macrophages. No. Not, right? No. I, I wouldn't call this DIP. <laughs> I would just say there's pit, lightly pigmented alveolar macrophages because I think there's another pro, there's a UIP going on here, right? Yes. And and that this is. A risk factor for UIP. Yeah, no, I'm only kidding, but <laughs> but you know the just the that um, one of one of my biggest problems with DIP is, you know, if you really need a term to describe lots of macrophages, then desquamative is the worst possible term you can come up with. Oh, well, probably. Right. That. Yeah. Okay. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> So a uh, question to everyone. So um, do you guys use molecular classifiers to support the diagnosis of UIP? Because I've seen some recent papers coming out. Uh, they've been using this molecular classifiers, especially in transbronchial cryobiopsies. Yes, I have two uh, thoughts about that, Adam. One is when pathologists keep on telling clinicians, we can't, can't agree with each other. We don't, We you know, one person's UIP is another person's NSIP we keep changing our mind, we don't make a diagnosis. Eventually what happens is they, they say, just get rid of these guys. They, they never make a diagnosis. Let's just send it to a better thing, which is molecular classifier. Is it really better? If you read the papers, it's horrible. I mean, the, the sensitivity and specificity both are really low. Like if a pathologist had that kind of sensitivity and specificity, they would be sued and thrown out of their department. But for a molecular classifier, somehow that is acceptable. And interestingly, I'll tell you just one anecdote before I stop, is we have, you know, we have seen a molecular classifier case being sent out, and the molecular classifier comes back UIP, and the patient has an adenocarcinoma. So that's the accuracy of this molecular classifier yeah, for yeah. tissue diagnosis. I just do not have any faith in this molecular classifier. Irene and Matt? Uh, we are not using these things. I read a little bit also. I think it's uh, with with non neoplastic lung is happening what the same as happened with uh, with neoplastic lung. I think we 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 thought or some people told us that our job is going to be uh, finished because one molecule would change everything. But I I I would. I have some faith. I would like that with a blood test, the patient is diagnosed or, and cancer disappears. But I don't. I don't think that is going to happen. Just like hasn't happened in neoplastic lung, that it's far more, more easier easy than than non neoplastic lung. Great point. I, I think the chances of this actually working are low, given that this is such a heterogeneous disease, right? Can you imagine taking a small biopsy of random spots in this and grinding it all up and putting it into a sequencer and getting something when it's such a, 
heterogeneous disease. If you take a, a gene expression picture of dense fibrosis versus a fibroblastic focus versus normal lung, you're going to get completely distinct gene expression signatures. But I do think there's a role for pathologists having a role in this molecular classifiers, you know, combining both tissue based um, analysis with gene expression changes. And I think there's technologies coming out to do that. And I think that will allow us to better classify these and to better understand the underlying etiology. Because I think that that is the next step for these and not just saying that these are UIP, but what's driving it and, and to get at those drivers as a way to better treat it. And I think if we as pathologists engage on that, you know, we'll be the ones leading that. And I think that's an important role for us in going forward. As we, do, as we do with neoplastic glands. Exactly, exactly. Yes. I think great discussion. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, yeah. We don't do any molecular classifiers or anything of that sort. Uh, there was a uh, uh, suggestion in this case, but otherwise uh, it was it was not done, and uh, I'm not aware of. Uh, uh, anybody bringing anything into our department. So that's what I could say. And I agree with all the points made on the molecular classifier that it just looks like uh, we have a uh, like this molecular testing for an unknown primary kind of thing. So it gives you uh, a number for like ovarian primary or a pancreatic primary. But in real, sometimes it's so like completely opposite of that, you find a mass somewhere else and now the patient has got a different primary than what your molecularly classified ID comes back. Yes, yes. And you know, that that's the problem is that, you know, the theory is actually exactly as Matt described. The theory is we want to all be a big happy family and yeah. you know, incorporate molecular and advance the science. The practical thing is it's, it's a horrible mess. Uh, same as artificial intelligence, you know, the theory is everything will be great and, you know, computers will come in. The reality is when you call a, a, a telephone center, have you ever had a, a automated uh, service answer your telephone? That's the reality. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah that's on a skeptic. That's on a skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> your, sorry, your lack of faith is... <laughs> All right, Raghav, great case. So just to talk, just to uh, finish the case, Raghav, can you just summarize for us what was your pathologic diagnosis and at the end, what was the clinical diagnosis and combining everything? Yeah, the, the pathologic diagnosis, we did uh, say that it's a UIP pattern with, uh, I made a description of this interstitial lymphoid aggregates with germinal centers and we raised the concern for a connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. Uh, even though there were some areas which looked like NSIP. Uh, but since uh, there was also smokers macrophages and some of those areas did have some ropey kind of quality to the collagen. So we did notice that in the comments saying that background, especially in the upper lobe, uh, this might be because of smoking related uh, fibrosis. Uh, and then uh, that's where we let it off uh, the uh, the report and then later on I learned that the patient was negative for connective tissue disease workup uh, and now I think the patient uh, is cut down on the smoking and he's still alive and uh, uh, he still is able to do his work. Okay so did they make an IPAF diagnosis at the end of the day or no? They just left it at UIP? In, in MDD we did uh, come to that uh, diagnosis IPAF. Uh, that was in MDD. Uh, Right. So, but it wasn't called IPF at the end of the day or no? No, it was not called IPF because there was an alternate signs of alternate diagnosis according to the guidelines of ATS, CRS. Again, that's another big uh, talk. <laughs> we'll leave that for another session later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so, thank you very much, Agav. Great case. Thank you for sharing it with us. Absolutely, my pleasure.